Talk, Identity, and Access, Management. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff, and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How are you? It's Friday. It's Friday, and it's the beginning of summer, or the end of spring, or however you want to look at it. Yeah, something. Memorial Day is Monday, so we've got a little bit of a break, nice long weekend, where it seems like every day is kind of weird at this point, but I'll roll with it. <laughs> every day is a new flavor of weird. Yes, it is. How's your health so been, Jeff? T- have, you been, uh, have you been sneezing or coughing on people? Uh, no more than usual, so I think we're good so far. What about yourself? No, I, I've been good, and the, the really weird thing is, like, for this whole pandemic thing to hit during allergy season, I finally have gotten to the point where with my, I'm on like two prescription allergy medications plus I use Flonase. I'm like, I'm well pharmaceuticalized in terms of allergy meds. So I don't really show symptoms like I used to. I used to be the type that my nose was running the whole time. I was coughing, sneezing, the entire spring and a lot of the fall. So I got to imagine a lot of people out there are doing the same thing, uh, (laughs) but just, you know, doing it right now, is just, it's not a welcome sight. Yeah. Well, you remember we were in Washington, uh, DC back in, well, it seems like forever ago. I think it was February (laughs) or maybe it was April. I'm not sure. And we were visiting a client and this was kind of right when the whole COVID thing was really kind of starting to get some traction in the U S and, you know, I felt we were there for, I think, three or four days and I felt fine the first day. And then whatever happened, you know, I just had bad allergies the second day or, or whatever it was. And, you know, I was like, this is, this is allergies. It's not, it's not COVID. <laughs> like, yeah. At least I was pretty sure it was because it just kind of came up out of nowhere and then, you know, took some Benadryl and, and I felt, I felt a lot better the next day, but yeah, we trying to explain to that to a, a new of, client. <laughs> we were happy to let you sit at the end of the table by yourself. Yeah, I offer as like, hey, if you guys want me to go back to the hotel room and work, I'm totally cool with that. I get it. Uh, that's kind of beyond the control, but it definitely was allergies. And uh, just like you said, bad timing <laughs> to have allergies um, right. because everyone's going to give you the look, right? Once you start coughing and sneezing, no matter where you're at. Well, yeah, when I used to, when I didn't have my allergies under control, I would sometimes have to pop a Benadryl or a Mucinex DM or whatever. I could get my hands on as powerful as I possibly could. Some days I'd show up for those meetings and just be, you know, such a fog. And so finally now I've I've gotten my my medication down pat and it doesn't affect my ability to stay focused and things like that. But you know, it can be a, it can be an issue. Yeah, I can I can certainly understand and empathize. I know we're going to talk a little bit about our main topic here in a little bit, which is the Verizon data, be- data breach investigations report that they just re- um, I know you learned a new word off of it. Do you want to share with our friends out there what it is? Pantechnicon. Oh, yeah. I think I'm saying that right. Pan- yeah. And yeah, basically, well, you tell the definition. I'll tell you what it, how I found it out. It is a large van for transporting furniture. And I had to look it up because I had no idea what that was. Yeah. I, that's one thing about the DBIR, the data breach in investigations report is that I think you pointed this out correctly. Maybe it was written by some folks in the UK. So it's definitely clear English, but there are a few words that you have to, you know, highlight and paste into Google and Pantechnicon was one. Uh, and even after I saw the definition, I was like, okay, I, I think the idea is it's a big bucket that you can, or a big thing that you can stuff a bunch of other things into because the context it was used was with regard to a bucket for types of breaches, which was the everything else pattern. And you're like, okay. And, and the funny thing was like everything else was like going into the top three uh, types of breaches that some organizations were, were experiencing. But the, Sentence goes, while the everything else pattern is a pantechnicon stuff with bits and bobs that do not fit anywhere else, dot, dot, dot. So <laughs> I was like, oh, wow, that was, 
that was one I had to look up. So yeah. you learn something new every day. Yeah. So if you take nothing away except for that from the from the uh, data breach report, I think you're going to be in shape. And the bits and bobs, that's that's the phrase. I was like, okay, that seems a little bit of British to me. So maybe that section was written somewhere with that background. I'm not sure. Um, yeah. And a previous experience I had working with a com- my, my company's international office in Dublin, they had a, people from, a lot of people from England um, and they held a fortnightly status meeting. And I remember that was the first time I ever heard the term Fortnite. And obviously now it's like <laughs> every kid in the world is playing Fortnite on their Xbox or their computer. It's like mm-hmm. common, a common phrase now, but I was a, you know, this is 20 years ago. It was the first time I'd ever heard it. I had to look it up. And, and, what it, and for what those is who Fortnite? don't know, yeah. it's 14 days. It's 14 days. Yeah. You know, every two 14 weeks. days, every two weeks, we have this meeting. Like, oh, okay. Isn't that, couldn't you call that bi-weekly? Or, <laughs> but I, I think there's the confusion, bi-weekly. Does that mean every two weeks or twice a week? Yeah, I think people have different definitions or interpretations of it sometimes, but... I think Fortnite just sounds cooler anyway. Definitely sounds cooler. Now, if you added Normal. like a, you know, a, a ye old with the E at the end, right? Ye old or a shop with the shoppy PPE at the end. Yep. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. definitely have to pay more money if you go to one of those places. <laughs> that's how you know you've got the good, you're in a good spot. <laughs> well, that's, that's why our buddy Ron Keys, we love having him on the show because he just sounds smarter than everybody else. So he gets like a few IQ points added to his total just because he's got that australian accent and it sounds kind of british and i don't know i just think he sounds smart i like hearing him talk yeah i think our audience liked it too we got some positive feedback on linkedin when we shared out that uh that episode so there are definitely fans of the australian accent uh let's see what else is going on before we get to the main event uh some conference news so gartner's usa iam summit they announced uh, i think it was this week um, that the one that's taking place at the end of the year in Vegas that you and I always typically end up at uh, has been canceled. Um, they didn't mention that it's going to become a virtual conference at all. So um, it sounds like it's just outright canceled and there won't be a replacement event this year for it. Being changes or there's some new. Yeah, I wanted to cry when I, when I saw that. <laughs> I mean, first off, it's all the way out in December. Um, one of our colleagues, Jeff Chang, pointed out that they had the uh, Gartner Security Summit um, pushed out to November. I don't think that's been canceled yet. So maybe they thought those two would be too close to one another. My feeling was, and it's certainly a conspiracy, I think that, you know, they have to start signing up sponsors. And, and I mean, this is a money-making event for them. They have to make sure people are on board with paying them the money so that they can operate this business and given the current state of affairs i would imagine a lot of companies don't want to make a a rock solid commitment to something out in december not knowing how things are going to be at that time so probably just made more sense for them to uh cancel based on that i mean i'd love it if we could you know if there's somebody out there who knows why it was canceled or maybe works for gardner uh, who can either share that information, come on the show, or, um, you know, even just shoot us an email. Uh, we'd love to know more information on why it was canceled. But I'm assuming it's something that, you know, just with all the COVID stuff going on that, you know, they couldn't get commitments from sponsors. Yeah. I mean, I'm disappointed that won't take place, but I get it. I think, you know, out of the abundance of caution, lots of conferences are shifting to at least virtual only, if not getting outright. Um, RSA's conference for next year, which typically takes place in February, which is the last conference I went to before, you know, things kind of went sideways here this year. Um, they've already pushed that back to May of next year. So, you know, I think there's a lot of precautions kind of, I know you and I will be disappointed because, you know, I think our, our tradition out there is that we make, uh, our friend, Mr. Chang, uh, buy us, uh, the buffet at Caesars, <laughs> the Bacchanal. Uh, which is the Bacchanal. the Bacchanal, which is a very good buffet. So that's been kind of like our tradition for the last few years is we make him take us there. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. And the, the likelihood of making a very, of this being a memorable year in terms of, you know, making elite status on airlines or hotels, it's not going to happen. 
Yeah, I think if you, you know, I think fortunately for, for us World Warriors, a lot of companies have already extended it out to 2022. So mm -hmm. I'm good until at least January of 2022. But if you run the path to earning, you know, maybe the lower thresholds will help. Yeah, I mean, I think the whole travel industry kind of hurt right now, obviously, especially the airlines and, the, and restaurants. Yeah, absolutely. And so yeah, I definitely feel for the people who are losing their jobs over those, that's for sure. Yep. Um, I've had a few family members that have fallen to that category, unfortunately. The sooner we can get past this, the better for sure. Uh, the other conference news that we've got going on here, Identiverse 2020, uh, that is taking place in a few weeks. That'll be a virtual event. Uh, I guess they're going to make some sort of announcement next week. I'm not sure what it is, but um, that's generally one of the better IAM conferences. Of these. I think it's one of the best ones. Typically more technical focus, which is good, uh, although they do have you know content pretty much for everybody. Like I said, this year it'll be virtual. It's usually in the middle of, so um, be on the lookout for that one as well. And I'll put a Is link to that. Is that a free that. one, Jeff? You know, I don't know. I'd have to look and see. It, it typically isn't, um, but you know, everything is kind of weird this year. So maybe this year will be free. Um, in any event, what they typically do is put the sessions onto their YouTube channel uh, over, out, over the rest of the year after they take place. So even if you can't make it live at some point, their, their YouTube channel would have you know, some of the important sessions that are out there. So I'm not sure if that's the plan this year. I don't see why it would be any different. Um, but with it being all virtual this year, um, who knows? So I guess head over to Identiverse website. I'll put a link to that in the show notes so people can find it. Um, but uh, we'll see. And then uh, as usual, you know, if there's any questions or comments up there, if there's a topic that, you know, you guys want us to talk about here, uh, our jibber jabber, as we like to say, you can always email us at questions at identityatthecenter.com. Anything else, Jim, you want to get into before we start talking about the data breach report? Yeah, I mean, just to tag on to that, I mean, questions are definitely, you know, great for us to, you know, things for us to talk about. But if people want to share their stories on how they're, you know, dealing with the, the pandemic in their own work environments, how it's affecting their IAM team in any way, you know, cutting budgets or, you know, op new opportunities or new challenges, either you know, write up an email. So it's kind of a story we could share. Uh, or, you know, if it's something you'd want to just come on the show and talk about. I mean, you know, you guys know we're open to having guests on the show and uh, it might be fun. It might be fun yeah. for you. <laughs> it might be. <laughs> might be. Uh, right. Can't guarantee it, but it should be okay. Uh, all right. Let's get into the 2020 Verizon data breach investigations report, which is quite the mouthful. I will have a link to this as well. <laughs> the Pen Technicon, right? I'll have a link to the report uh, in the show notes. You can find those, you know, wherever your podcast service has them and are also at identityatthecenter.com. Um, as far as the numbers go, you know, 81 organizations, 81 countries, so it covers the globe. Uh, they looked at over 150,000 incidents uh, 32,000 of those met their quality standards to be uh, counted as an incident. And of those 32,000, 4,000, or almost 4,000, were confirmed data breaches. So if you do the math on that, if you got 4,000 data breaches in 2019, that is almost 11 breaches a day every day of 2019 around the world, which is just an insane number of breaches. <laughs> and that's not even incidents, right? That's, that's confirmed uh, breaches. So I think it's important before we get too far here and we start talking numbers is to define what an incident is. And you know, an incident is, it's a security event that compromises CIA. So confidentiality, confidentiality, integrity, or availability of an asset. Whereas a breach takes it a step further and it's a result in a confirmed disclosure, not just the potential exposure of data to an authorized party. So that's the difference between an incident and a breach, and that's something that you'll want to keep in mind as we're talking here. And uh, some of the other things that they classified as action types, those are hacking, social, error, malware, misuse, and a physical action type, so like physical security, that sort of thing. So keep those kind of things in mind here as we're talking, and uh, let's just kind of jump right into it. Jim, what do you want to start with? i start with um, the types of breaches. So 37% um, of breaches uh, were the use of stolen or use, or came as a result of stolen or used credentials. So um, that number kind of struck me as low. But as I went through the report, I realized that there were other areas that kind of lean on that same process, same 
you know, what I would call logging in um, mm-hmm. that make the number much higher. So I think some of it is in the, the wording of the classification of the data. Um, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, one of the things, one of the parts of the report that I found very interesting was kind of jump toward the end of the report or um, how the breaches affect large versus small to mid-sized businesses, large organization versus small to mid-sized. And, you know, the types of um, events that they are experiencing. And so one of the things that are very infrequently used against large organizations are brute force attacks. And in my experience in working with a lot of large organizations, they have uh, controls in place. Most of them have controls in place to prevent those types of attacks, to identify them and prevent them. And mm-hmm. I would imagine that smaller businesses, it, you know, it, it total generality. And that's what you get with reports is generalities and they're aggregating data from multiple sources. But when you start seeing that 10% of the incidents came as a result of a brute force attack for small to mid-sized businesses, say, hmm, they must not all have that con- that type of control in place. Yeah, you have to imagine that a small, smaller mid-sized business probably doesn't have the security budget, right, of a large organization or enterprise type security. They're making do with, you know, tools that may be included with some of the things that they've got, you know, if they have them. You know, I think of things like Active Directory, you know, how many small businesses actually have an Active Directory, right? They may be using some sort of G Suite or, you know, maybe just Office 365. They don't have an on-prem or you know, anything like that. So, um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting because I see a lot of issues at small businesses that are kind of like no-brainers, right? For people who are experienced in IEMs, like, yeah, why are you doing that? It doesn't make any sense, right? You shouldn't be doing that. And the reality is, you know, it, it's very hit or miss as far as the security knowledge level at the organization. You know, if you're a mom and pop shop and, you know, you, you make hot dogs and fries for people, um, really probably the only thing you care about is your payment card information because you have to. And you probably either outsourcing it or having some sort of turnkey service that takes care of it for you. Um, right. So you may not necessarily be concerned on the security side, whereas you know, maybe your Wi-Fi is open and maybe your open Wi-Fi in your cafe leads to an office computer. Not saying that I didn't have this happen uh, 20 years ago as I was sitting in a cafe <laughs> and, and was able to access you know, someone's office PC and look at receipts. And then when you inform the manager, say, hey, you should probably lock that down. They say, oh, no, it's very secure. And then you show them on the computer that, no, it's not. <laughs> Yeah. Not saying that that ever took place. I'm just, you know, highlighting that as a potential example of what you might get in a smaller. Plus the guy who goes to the Black Hat conference every year, people. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm not definitely, I'm definitely not a, you know, hacker in quotation marks. But, you know, back 20 years ago, you know, people, you know, had common names for routers and passwords and, you know, didn't know anything about changing that kind of stuff. And, you know, some still don't. But um, right. you just, you never know where you're going to get out there. So. You have to be careful about the security of these. It's interesting how often you, if you use a MacBook, when you enter a public Wi-Fi, it'll say, you know, MacBook mm-hmm. uh, one, MacBook one, that name's already taken on the network. We're going to temporarily change the name of this computer to MacBook two. And you're like, how in the world did that happen? You know, unless you look <laughs> behind the scenes, there's all kinds of broadcasting going on and, certain ports could be open, you know, just, I feel like there's a false sense of security when using those public Wi-Fi's. But um, one point I wanted to make was just, you know, in the report, they talk about these small to mid-sized businesses being a thousand employees or less and a large being a thousand employees or more. I think that's a pretty good classification, but it we within the thousand that's still a pretty big range a small company yeah. of 15 20 people is go, not going to have an active directory or more than look there's not going to have an active they're going to use pretty basic down to the gristle type or you know imagine if you have a you know a couple hundred employees but only you know a couple dozen of them have computers it, totally different scenario than if you have a thousand information workers or 500, 600, 700 information workers, you have a totally different 
type of IT environment. Yeah. Mm. Did they define what small business would be compared to medium? I know a thousand was kind of like the break point, but where does small they, come in? They just, they just, they just bucketed for the purposes of the survey. They just bucketed them as small or SMB and that mm -hmm. was a thousand or fewer. Gotcha. So, okay. but I, one of the main points that they're driving home in the report is that the types of events that small and large organizations are experiencing are growing a lot more alike than they were in 2013. The last time they talked about this, uh, it's, you know, seven years ago, six, seven years ago, where small organizations, all organizations are moving more toward as a service type delivery models for their applications and their IT footprint, both large and small are moving toward that. So they're starting to experience the same types of, of incidents and having the same type of, um, you know, IT portfolio. So what I think you have in large businesses is also you have a lot of legacy infrastructure and then you layer on top of that a, a lot of security tools. So it generally becomes more complex uh, but, you know, Salesforce or Workday, those types of um, as-a-service delivery models are used by small and large organizations. So mm -hmm. Some of the threats are, uh, and the protections are the same, regardless of whether you're small or large. Yeah, I imagine phishing is probably a very common thing that happens across the board, no matter who. Yeah, I mean, phishing definitely ranks as, as one of the highest, but you know, interestingly, what jumped off the page to me was spyware or malware. Um, basically, malware as a category was like, you know, by far the biggest threat. And you got to think, okay, how do, and that's why I think what you're, this is not an IAM report. This is security incident report. And so mm -hmm. when you see that number at, you know, 37% where it's credential based. Um, that's because a lot of the incidents are happening via malware. Those are things that are being sent to people in email. They're, they're clicking and opening files and they infect the network. Um, and that's, you know, small and large organizations. I would say in small organizations, you know, kind of the, the way it looks to me is these are our bigger types of uh, threats of the malware. Um, then, you know, kind of the hacking type of threats, which are more the uh, hacking and phishing or, or they call social. So mm -hmm. phishing had its own, um, its own classification for social threat, um, and a social meaning social engineering. Yeah. I think that's an important piece of information to put this in context, right? The, the, the report is not IAM specific. It is security as a whole. But even when you consider that, if you say 37% of all of the incidents, you know, had to do with breaches that used credentials, whether they were stolen or misused or whatever it may be, that's, that's a huge number from a percentage standpoint, considering all the different options that could be out there between social, malware, ransomware, you know, different things like that, or even just errors, right, that people have because that misconfiguration was, was another big item. Um, and a lot of times, it's not just one thing that leads to an incident or a breach. It's a combination of things. Um, I know that there was a chart they had in there that was a little tough to read, uh, but and it took me a little bit to understand it, but there was one chart that showed, you know, kind of like the number of steps or actions that are needed to create an incident or a breach. And the vast majority of them had somewhere in like the, you know, one to six or seven steps that were used by the attacker to conduct the incident or the, and yeah. you, you know, it's different ways. It, it might start with malware and then it becomes, you know, ransomware and then it becomes, you know, social engineering or, you know, maybe credential misuses in there at some point. So a lot of these events all tie back to the credential. And, you know, I think that's one of the things that stuck out to me is, uh, you know, one of their notes was that 80% of breaches uh, that included the hacking part were brute force or the use of those lost or stolen credentials. So the vast majority of hacking type actions definitely tied back to, you know, IDs and passwords essentially. Right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if, you have the, if you have an ID or a password, I think that's going to be, you know, one of the most effective ways, but you know, it's whether it's phishing or it's 
emailing somebody malware, um, the same kind of, it, it's interesting because we had a conversation last week about a different report and the, just kind of identifying um, user education as it could have prevented a, uh, a breach from taking place. And it's malware and phishing are, you know, still kind of the main attack vectors, sending somebody an email and getting them to either, you know, tricking them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to go out to a website and type in their creds or tricking them to open a file. It's like, hey, this is an Excel spreadsheet of, of the uh, of salaries or something. They launch it. It's not really a spreadsheet. It just goes off and starts infecting the network with, with bad stuff. And then, you know, compound all that is the detection. <laughs> you know, hopefully the person opens that doc, opens that file and then call somebody and says, you know what, I just opened a file and I think bad things happen. They, mm -hmm. One, they might not know, or number two, they might be too embarrassed and hope that like they closed it in time. Or right. Pulled the, or at least their pulled the network cable. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Pull the network Got the Wi-Fi yeah. or something. Right. There's death, taxes, compromised passwords, and phishing <laughs> are all the constants in life, I think, that are out there. You know, we all have a Nigerian prince that's emailing us that wants to give us a large sum of money. They just need our help. So yeah. it's, it's exploitative, you know, that's for sure. But um, well, we've had emails go around within our company where it looks like it's coming from our CEO. Like, hey, this is the CEO. And mm -hmm. you got to think, this is a 50-person company um, where somebody has gone out, probably to LinkedIn or to our website and said, oh, this is the CEO. I'm going to create a Gmail account. We're going to use the name Victor Barris, uh, you know, as the person, as who I am. And I'm going to say, hey, you know, I need you to go out to the site and fill out a survey. And it brings you to screen. It looks like you're supposed to log into your email. You type in your password. And boom. You just give away your that's credentials. It. Yeah, that's email it. spoofing is one of the easier things to do, too. So just a little bit of, and you know, gathering of information. You know, even if you have a forwarded email, you know, most people in a company, they probably have their name, right? Their title, their phone number, <laughs> you know, all this is part of their signature block. And if that gets in the wrong hands or gets, you know, moved around or if you can find it on LinkedIn, et cetera, it makes it a lot easier to perform that, that targeted phishing, um, which is more spear phishing and, you know, it would technically be called. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's always interesting to see those types of things come around. It's like, okay, you know, how do they figure this out? And we had a, actually a pretty good conversation with Richard Bird a while back where he, he talked about some of the privacy and data events that he experienced. And that was a, that was a great episode. So I would definitely recommend if you haven't heard that one that, you know, go back and listen to that one. Um, but uh, yeah, getting the information out there, you know, where we can be susceptible to it just like anyone. You know, I'm wondering, Jeff, is there a mm -hmm. place for um, antivirus software anymore? Does, is it relevant? I think so, but I don't think it's um, the end all be all, right? If you're putting all your eggs in the antivirus basket, you're going to have a bad time. I mean, I still think there's a value for it, um, especially if you have machines that are not locked down and people are local administrators and can install whatever they want, um, right? Because one of the you know things that people like to do is, you know, they'll drop a, a USB drive in the parking lot. Someone will take it in, trying to figure out what it is, just natural curiosity, plug it in and bang, you know, things are bad if you're a local admin and that's how things spread typically from a malware perspective. Um, antivirus may help catch it, but it's a cat and mouse game, right? Where you're constantly having to download definitions. So if your antivirus is not up to date and it's using a newer, you know, virus or, or Trojan or whatever it may be that your program doesn't have a definition for, it may not catch it. So I think it's helpful, but I you know, I, it's like anything else. You need to have the the security onion where you've got different layers. You know, if you if you have antivirus plus you have um, you know lockdown administrator rights where people are not typically local administrators on the machines, I think that's a thousand percent better than than having you know. Right. Yeah. I think um, I think my feeling with antivirus is always been even if you download the definitions today and they were just released today if there's a virus that was just written and it didn't make it into the definitions, then what really good does it do you? Um, if that is happens, happens to be the virus that hits you. Um, yeah. 
Now I've heard with some antivirus software that it looks for patterns. So it's not just simply, you know, is this a program that's trying to execute a specific virus that um, we're aware of, but it looks for the types of things that viruses do. Um, so that I think can be helpful, but I think your, your point is well taken. It's the security onion. It's, it's, um, part of the defense strategy, but it's not everything. Yeah. And that heuristics approach, which is what you're referring to where, you know, AV may look for different patterns, et cetera. That's something that's been out for a while and it, you know, it's hit or miss. It's looking at, you know, different types of things and trying to classify it, you know, as potentially a virus, but that's also where you get false positives too. Right. So if you ever tried to, if you've ever had antivirus installed and try to run a legitimate program, uh, you know, windows actually has this built in with, uh, smart screen, which is part of the Windows 10 OS, you may occasionally get a prompt that says, hey, we think this is a virus, even though you're fairly confident that it's not, right? It's, it's not part of their database, but whatever you know, install you're trying to run, they have classified as maybe something that's not uh, legitimate. It, there's there's a, you know, a pro and a con for, for each of it, I guess, but that heurist, heuristics uh, feature is something that's you know, hopefully standard across the board. I remember, I remember that used to be, you know, hot to trot, man. That was like, you know, nobody had that except for Norton or McAfee or whatever it was called. McAfee, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Now McAfee's out there. And I'll be honest, it's one of the first things I I uninstall uh, when I have a new PC because I just can't stand it. It's so um, invasive and intrusive and uh, I'll use other things, you know, malware bytes and, uh, you know, built-ins and stuff like that. But yeah. here's, here's, Here's an information security conundrum. I've heard McAfee, and to me, it seems very clear. It, when you look at the word, it's pronounced McAfee. I've mm-hmm. also heard people say McAfee and McPhee. So are you asking which is right? I is there even a is there even an argument, or are the <laughs> other people just like trying to be fancy? Well, so it's named after John McAfee, and I believe I've heard him pronounce him, his na- own name as McAfee. So that's typically what I've gone with. <laughs> Um, before it got bought out, you know, by, you know, Norton and all these other, you know, companies that kind of consumed each other, but I'm pretty sure it's McAfee. So that's what I'm going to go with until uh, I hear someone tell me differently. So that, that uh, lens you just looked at that through, but I'll apply that to Linux. So I've been saying, I've finally given up and I say Linux, but when, um, if, when the operating system first started getting Notoriety, I cover Linux, or I'm uh, Linux, because it was invented by Linus Sobalts. And mm-hmm. Linus is, you know, what it was named after. So I figured Linux. And I heard some other people who were really into it call it that. But I think everybody's given up because the whole world calls it Linux. Linux. And I think there's a lot of sometimes, con- you know, confusion between Linux and Unix and now, and then it becomes just Nix, <laughs> right? With yeah. a star in the front. Star Nix. So, <laughs> yeah. So I use, I use Linux, Unix, and Nix all kind of interchangeably. It's probably not technically right, but um, that's just the way that I roll. <laughs> you did bring up a, a barn burner type of topic though, with the local admin rights, mm-hmm. because I think, I think everybody deals with this who comes into an organization and they're the, they're responsible for information security. If you come into an organization, people have admin rights and have always had admin rights to their computer and some powerful people don't want to take it away from them. Um, but if you know that you don't have kind of a zero trust model in place in your network and, you know, if one of your computers gets a COVID-19 type virus is going to spread very quickly. <laughs> Um, I, what are your thoughts there? What, what do you advise your clients when you hear that they have admin rights on the local PCs? I tell them they should not do that. That's my advice is take away the admin rights. Now right. that's a way easier said than done. Right. And I think it's one of the most disruptive things that you can do from a user experience perspective when it comes to security. So you have to be very careful about how you execute against it. I think it's a lot easier if you can be ahead of the curve when you're a smaller company, right? And there's less people involved 
um, to be able to get away with that and just make that the default security stance that you're not, you know, people are generally not local admins. They typically shouldn't need it and, and uh, you know, let someone with elevated permissions kind of help. Um, you know, I've gone through a couple of, you know, big organizations where that got rolled out and the most recent one was a complete secret to the enterprise. You know, it was, it was a security project. It was a need to know basis because what you don't want to do is say, hey, we're going to take everyone's admin rights next Tuesday. So that becomes, oh my gosh, I need to go out and install all the things that I can <laughs> before Tuesday yeah. before they take it away. So, um, you know, you, you flip the switch and all of a sudden you're running like a group policy or you, maybe you've got, you know, um, uh, a security application that you've purchased to help with, this, you know, the admin rights. And then all of a sudden it becomes a huge strain on the users. The service staff starts getting calls, so they need to be trained. So I feel it's one of the most disruptive things uh, from an end user experience if it's not managed appropriately. It's going to be disruptive no matter what, how bad of a situation is going to be totally is dependent on communication plan, training strategy, you know, training processes and, and how you plan on supporting it going forward, because you're absolutely right. You're going to have people who expected to have it, no longer have it, you know, executives expect to have it, even though they're the most, probably the most targeted, most sensitive of, of users that you probably shouldn't have it. <laughs> so it's definitely uh, something to take a look at and make sure that you're managing it, uh, you know, effectively from a uh, process standpoint. Yeah, you brought up a lot of great points there. I think one of the things as an information security leader, you have to get comfortable in discussing risk. And mm -hmm. the organization, the leadership of the organization is going to have to make decisions on which risks to uh, do something to mitigate, which risks to accept. And right. I generally find that, you know, giving people administrative rights to their computer is not going to be a risk worth accepting in most cases. Um, I also think it doesn't have to be a black and white policy that applies to every single person. So if you had 95% of the computers without admin rights, that significantly reduces the risk. Those 95 computers don't aren't likely to fall prey to the same kind of um, misuse. Now, I'm not saying that's ideal, right? I don't want people to come away and say, uh, Jim said we should shoot for 95%. I think 100% is what you should, should shoot for, or say 99%. Um, but better is, is should not, oh, you know, it's like a, a, a quality management term that or a phrase to go to something like uh, perfection should not be the enemy of better. Uh, right. In other words, if you can get better, then you should get better. The other thing that, that you mentioned there is a couple of things that I thought were spot on. Just like you don't need to make a big pronouncement that you're taking people's rights away. And number two is you don't have to roll it out to the entire company at the same time because more than likely, or more than likely, the service desk is going to see a, see an increase in the number of calls that they're going to get because if you implement it and you don't implement it perfectly. You might have some unintended consequences, plus the intended consequences. Somebody goes and they want to install like a Adobe Acrobat, you know, creator application that downloaded off of a freeware site and now won't install. So they're going to have to open up a ticket with the help desk, right? But that's kind of what you want it to happen because you don't want people downloading free software and installing it on their corporate device most of the time unless it's been approved. Um, so that creates a whole extra process, but you might roll out the policy and now people can't open up an Excel spreadsheet that has a macro embedded in it that they use for their work every day. And you didn't realize that that was going to happen. So you don't want to push it out to, you know, thousands of people overnight. You want to try and roll it out over time. Uh, so I think those are just some, some different things to take into account, but I do think you know, at the core of it, as an information security leader, you have to get comfortable talking about risk and getting your leadership to understand that they need to make conscious decisions about which risks to accept and which risks to invest to mitigate. Yeah, and I think that's why relationship building is so important for security leaders at all levels, but, you know, especially typically CISOs and things like that is position 
yourself as a consultant and as an advisor or with their best interest at heart, right? Not just be the no guy, <laughs> you know, or girl and find ways to, you know, partner with them and help them understand the risks. And at the end of the day, the business is typically going to make the decision of whether they're going to accept that risk or not. And there's a lot of different ways that it can roll out, you know, in the case of <clears throat> um, local, uh, local admin rights. And there is no best practice, I don't think. I think every organization is significantly sufficiently different in that, you know, there needs to be some discussion around how do we want to get this out there? You know, if that's a path that the organization decides to take, you know, do you roll it out piecemeal? Do you do big bang? You know, do you target certain departments maybe that are risky first? So these are all things that have to be taken into consideration as part of that plan. Absolutely. Um, you know, there was another number that I thought was pretty interesting um, because it kind of, it, it talked about, where 81% of breaches in this report um, were discovered in days or less, which I thought was pretty good, actually. And that seems like that's been an improvement where organizations are detecting things faster. I know that there were some previous reports where I think, you know, it was like three months or six months before, you know, sometimes breaches were discovered and, you know, that leads to loss, et cetera. But it seems to me like the trend in the report here is that, companies are getting better at identifying um, breaches quicker. Yeah, it's a data point. Um, I feel like this is optimistic. Um, I don't know. I mean, sometimes you see numbers and they just don't match up with your experience. And this is one of those areas for me. I'm not going to say this is wrong, but I'd like to see some more data in future reports kind of confirming this. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, months to detect, uh, breaches have occurred is probably more accurate when you read about major breaches, not just incidents, but when you read about breaches, it's usually they, they took place over the course of a couple of months. And, um, that's my experience tells me that this is probably not a data point that I'm going to just buy off one until I get some cross-confirming data elsewhere or reports. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think, you know, part of it is the, um, the, the experience that we get is we're typically seeing less mature organizations. So I wouldn't expect them to be as on the ball <laughs> with catching stuff um, when it comes to at least identity related type of, uh, you know, breach triggers, those sorts of things or, in, or uh, indicators. Um, so I would, I would like to see it more because I still think that is a little bit optimistic. And that's why I was a little bit surprised that, you know, a lot of them were discovered in days or less in quotation marks and doing it here that you can't, can't see. <laughs> <laughs> so I would like to see more data on it. It doesn't necessarily line up with my experience, but that's, that might be okay because, you know, I think our experiences are that we tend to see less mature organizations versus more mature organs by the nature well, of work that, that you and I do. Included in my experience, though, is just, you know, publicly available information on some of the major breaches that have occurred with other large public companies. So mm -hmm. after they dissect those, I, you know, I, I feel like I'm, I'm basing that more on things I've read about some of the breaches that have been in the news and how long it takes those rather sophisticated companies to even realize that they've been bleeding this data. Um, yeah. You know, this is... What is in the Verizon report, I believe, is self-reported information. Um, that doesn't mean it's not true or accurate, but it's, you know, um, it, the other thing is I think there's a variance of, like, you know, what is the, the breach? Um, you know, is it, like, an Equifax level breach or is it something much smaller where, you know, a couple hundred credit cards are stolen? Um, so there's that, um, but yeah, anyway, I, I, I guess long and short of it is that it's something to keep an eye on. I feel like, um, you know, I, I asked the question of myself, like how are companies even finding out when they're breached? Um, what is the mechanism? Is it that they've got good logging and alerting? I mean, that I, I find that um, hard to believe in most cases. I, I, feel like when I find out about um, most like publicly announced breaches where there's been major uh, losses of data, 
it's usually found out by um, pe people posting the information on the dark web, quite honestly. It's like, shoot, that's our data, or someone figures out, uh, oh, that was this bank's data or this company's data that got, that got dumped out here on the dark web. And that's how the company found out that they got breached. They didn't find out using their own security tools. So when I hear that, oh, we, we're finding out about breaches in days, and then a, another part of the report, or maybe it was the same part of the report, another uh, data point was that 0% of the breaches are never found out about. Yeah. <laughs> Okie dokie. It's, sure. zero, it's zero right now because they don't know it. <laughs> yeah. So It's less, you know, it's it's less than 0%. <laughs> it's, it's negative one percent. We find out about all of them, and then so we know we know everything about everything all the time. Yes. You know, does so. Here's a question: If if eighty one percent of breaches were discovered in days or less, does a ransomware pop up count as discovered? <laughs> right. Exactly. Is that how you found out? Because I would say that's a little bit too late at that point. <laughs> right. Or yeah. Or yeah. Ransomware took down. All of your locked up all your servers right yeah, yeah hey we've got a breach yeah no uh no bull <laughs> i'll keep it clean <laughs> yeah exactly well that that could be yeah that could be definitely skewing the numbers in one direction again it's kind of the the magnitude of the breach right all right i know we're we've been going on here for a little bit um i don't really have anything else i want to bring up i think it was a really good report it's long it's like a 118 pages or something like that. Um, and hopefully, you know, this was helpful from a summary perspective, but, you know, we'll have a link to this uh, in our show notes so that people can check it out if they haven't already. Uh, Jim, is there anything else that you want to bring up before we uh, wrap for this uh, episode? You know, one of the things I'll say is that um, I have a ton of respect. Anything we said throughout this, this podcast is not to disrespect the work that went into this or the data that went into this. They've been publishing this report. I read in the report, this is the 13th issuance of this report. And, you know, we we use this thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, it's yeah. it's kind of unique for the industry, uh, how much data it provides and, and the kind of data it provides us. So I have a ton of respect for the folks that put it together and I'm grateful for them doing it. And uh, yeah, I think that Folks out there who are in our industry should go out because one of the things I think is really cool is like an industry by industry breakdown of where, you know, where specific industries are more or less vulnerable. And, um, you know, so if you're an IAM in retail or you're an IAM in telecommunications, so there are specific sections of the report devoted to your industry. So, um, a lot of different cross points. I mean, the, you said it's a big report. It's over 100 pages. I mean, there's a mm -hmm. ton of data out there. Uh, and I can't say I read it from cover to cover, but um, yeah, really fantastic information and something that is kind of unique within our industry. And I think, you know, pretty respected in terms of the content that. Are oh, yeah, super respected. I, it, it's a fantastic report. Um, you know, it's a benchmark report that a lot of organizations look to every year. So you know, I'm happy that we're able to discuss it this year. The thing that I like most about it, though, is it's, it's not written in a very technical language. So it's very easy to understand and digest. They do a very good job of explaining some of the concepts, maybe, if people may not be familiar with it. So uh, it should not be intimidating for people, you know, as they're reading through it. It's, it's definitely educational and like, like you said there's a lot of specific information around different industries you know even regions etc so highly recommended and you know sometimes the language is even a little bit cheeky if i'll if i'll throw that out there <laughs> since we're using the uh the british uh, uh motif earlier <laughs> yeah. so it's a it's a great report definitely for sure all right well i think with that we'll go ahead and wrap it for this week uh, Jim, hope you enjoy a long weekend and folks here in the U.S. Uh, are celebrating Memorial Day and uh, want people to stay happy and healthy out there. And uh, we'll talk to everyone in the next one. Yeah, happy Memorial Day, everyone. And thank you to all the, the brave uh, people who have served the country. Exactly. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Listening to the Identity at the Center podcast. 
For more episodes, visit identityatthecenter.com.